Hello, I'm Tiffany Cloud. Welcome to a special commercial free episode of The Storm. I am joined today by Matt Connolly. He's a Republican and he is a candidate for Congress in the 17th Congressional District. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Matt. Great to be here, Tiffany. Great always, to have you here. Is. Oh, thank you so much. It's your second time here it on is the Storm. Second time. Yes. Well, for those not so familiar with you, um, I'd really like to start out first. I should say congratulations for the decision to run for Congress. Um, why don't you tell the audience a bit about yourself and your background, and then uh, why you decided to run for Congress? Okay. Well, Matt Conley, 50 years old. Uh, for 25 years, I made my living as a professional auto racer and team owner. It was my American dream, which I was able to accomplish. Um, that sort of changed when Obama became president and the sponsors said, you know what, we're terrified of this guy. We're not spending any money on sponsorships or anything else. You've been great, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that anymore. I had to adjust, I had to adapt. I turned my race shop into a auto repair shop. I went back to being a contractor again as far as home building and rest restoring uh, historic properties and things. And I decided that I have to get a little more involved. Mm -hmm. That just being a political activist, I worked for Ross Perot in 1992. That was my start. Oh, okay. And supporting other candidates. And then running for Congress in 2014 was, was my step into saying, you know what? I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You did run for the seat, as you just pointed out, yes. uh, two years ago. Um, you, you suffered a defeat in the primary. However, if memory serves, there are what six? Six, six Yeah, counties. there are six counties, and you won five of the six. The They're, only area right. that you sort of uh, lost was more Schuylkill. the Schuylkill. Only Schuylkill County. There were f six counties. Okay. I won five out of six. Now, there were three of us in the primary. Yes. I won two of those counties with more than 50%. However, Dr. David Moylan, who was mm -hmm. the eventual nominee, won Schuylkill County big enough to erase my lead everywhere else. Now, three, three weeks after the general election in November, he unfortunately didn't win, and he called me and said, Matt, are you going to run in 16? I said, yeah, I plan on it. He said, good. I'm 100% behind you, and my team is 100% behind you. So that was pretty nice. Well, that's a very, very nice endorsement. Yes, Congratulations on that. I mean, I do believe that two years ago, had you won the Republican nomination, that it would have been a very interesting race against Congressman Cartwright. Boy, and Cart I think yes. you could have well, possibly won that. I was, really do. There was a blogger uh, who followed me very closely, and his title was Cartwright Dodges a bullet with Connolly out of the race. Mm -hmm. and, and he, uh, I, he I would right. agree with that. Well, thank you. So what are you going to do this time differently to um, ensure, because you do have an opponent in the primary, um, what are you going to do to ensure that you not only retain the strong performance in those five counties, but you have a strong performance in that six? Well, the important difference is Schuylkill County. When you have Dr. David Moylan and Teresa Santi Gaffney, who was a quarter of Wills, who was also 100% behind me, that takes out the last, the last remaining piece that we didn't have last time. I'm still going to keep my strength in the other five counties. Uh, the name ID, I have 40 volunteers among those counties that are working for me every day, and they are terrific people. I, I'm going to keep moving on and, and keeping the message going. Okay. I'd like you to take a moment, and I'm going to get to some comments that your primary opponent made, because I interviewed him on the show okay. a couple short weeks ago. I want you to have a chance to respond. But I'd like to first ask you to really delineate between yourself and your primary opponent. What do you think makes you more qualified to face uh, Congressman Cartwright in the general? Well, you have to look at where we are as a country right now. If we want to bring back America back to its greatness, which it, which it had, which I believe we're slightly in decline from that, you have to look at what the country was made up of. How did it work? We are facing the opposite direction. We are heading in the opposite direction right now. Mm -hmm. If we're going to change it, we need candidates and congressmen who are willing to make the U-turn and head back the other direction. A moderate won't do that. I believe my opponent is a moderate. Okay. Also, when it comes down to other things, he is just beginning the third year of his four-year term that he got elected to a couple years ago, county council. And he's already going to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not something I would do. That's not a commitment level that I would have. I wouldn't do half of something and then begin some next stepping stone. I was committed to this since 2014, and you know that. But those are just some important differences. OK. Um, he would suggest uh, uh, that the differences are, per his words, um, that he believes he has a greater ability to uh, fund a campaign, that he could 
raise the capital needed because you're going to be up in the general against an incumbent who's going to be, have major financial backing from the DNC. And the unions and, and the, the unions. trial lawyers exactly. and everything else. Absolutely. He says he's the guy that can raise the capital needed and more so than you. What do you say to that? I'm not sure where he gets that. Uh, we're doing fine fundraising and if it was just about money, why have an election? Why not say whoever has the most cash wins? So. I'm, I'm, I know he's all about the money because he talks about it all the time, but I'm not sure. You know, you have to look at the three-way race we had two years ago. Mm -hmm. The person who finished dead last, he raised the most money. Yeah. Fair point. Okay. So you got to connect with people. You have to have a message, and they have to understand your passion as to why you are running. Okay. That's something that's pretty obvious with me, I think. Okay. Well, why don't you tell me a bit and tell the audience a bit about that message? It, it comes down to the founding principles. It was virtually miraculous to have the confluence of the people their backgrounds, their intelligence, and most importantly, their courage. You gotta realize that when they, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they were committing treason against England. They, were, they could be hanged and no one could argue with that. How many politicians do we have today who would be willing to put their necks on the line for this nation? Mm -hmm. I can't really name very many of them. Well, one of the things I find fascinating about you, and you and I have talked about this in past when you run, ran last time, but you know, here you've made this career prior to this political auto run. Auto racing, right. Auto yeah. racing. Yeah. And you My have American dream, absolutely. literally put your neck on the line in part of your career. I mean, you have taken tremendous True. risk and chances. <laughs> so you certainly, you know, strike me as someone who's definitely gutsy. Well, I think, I think the key to saving this nation is going to be courage. Mm -hmm. And it's the cur courage, not in the way some people might think. It's not the absence of fear but it's acting in spite of fear. You gotta realize, as a congressperson, the hardest part of the job is going to be facing the people, usually in your own party, who put their arm around you and say, you know, Matt, this is just how it's done. This is how you have to vote. You might not like it, but this is part of the problem. I'm gonna say, no, no, I did not run on the platform of being an establishment moderate. I am coming here as a conservative, trying to bring us back to the greatness we had. People talk to me about, you know, there's too much money in government. There's too much lobbyists, there's all sorts of things. All of those things occurred when the line between the founding principles got blurred and ultimately erased. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we have lobbyists? Well, because when, when you can use the highest bidder technique to change the laws based on who you convince to change their votes for your company or whatever, you're now changing the, diff the relationship between the founding fathers, the role of government, which is to keep us safe and protect the Bill of Rights, into, well, we want this company to win at the expense of that. Look at Solyndra, when the government backs loans to a company that has a failing business model. Look at Obamacare, when they go to the insurance companies and say, hey, don't worry about it. Just support this law and we'll guarantee that every person in America has to buy your product. Mm -hmm. Who's going to say no to that? It's not the role of government to do that. So there's a lot of money involved in government because of the influence. I'm going to resist the influence and that's going to take courage. It certainly is because a lot of people say they're going to resist the influence, but then they get down there and they see all the white buildings and the column and the pa and they get sucked into the power. And so you. This isn't are about me. Okay. This is about my country. My country means more to me than anything. It is not about Matt Conley, Congressman, at all. It is not at that. No. no. Okay. No. You've mentioned you've used the word moderate mm -hmm. twice now. Yeah. Um, when alluding to your opponent in the primary, why, why do you say that he is a moderate? Because he said so. He said so. He said, my problem is I'm too far right. That you're too want, far right. That you're too I'm far I'm too far right. right. Okay. I want to change too much. He just kind of wants to steer the ship a little bit. We got to turn this country around. Otherwise, where we're heading is Europe, and Europe isn't working. Okay. Let's say that you break through the primary. You are the Republican nominee. I want to talk about your opponent, Congressman Cartwright, a bit. I had him on the show not two, three weeks ago. And my first question to the congressman was, tell me what is the most important issue facing this nation right now? Because I wanted to hear. Please don't say climate change, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting because I wanted to hear what he had to say. He started by talking about the, the threat of terrorism, et okay. cetera. But then he suggested um, that that and climate change are intrinsically linked because what he said was that climate change, i.e. global warming, leads to drought, which leads to starvation, the oppression of people, terrorists rising up, and so that they are intrinsically linked. If I ask you the question, what is the most important issue facing this nation, would you have the same answer? 
I think the congressman should get a job as a fiction writer. That would be, that would be excellent because if it was about starvation, we could send food. That's not a problem. Um, that, that is very interesting. What it shows is the lengths they will go in order to take a non-issue. It hasn't warmed in 20, what, 23 years now? There has been no exceptional droughts in the Middle East or anything like that. If anything, their food supply has grown. For them to use that kind of, that kind of logic just basically tells you they are looking for any wedge or lever possible in order to put people against each other to try to find a new way to tax and regulate the people of, of the industrialized world and so they can redistribute the money and gain more control. It, it's, that's, that's a little disturbing, I hate to say it. So to you, what would be the number one issue then? The, with this nation? Facing the nation. Well, mm -hmm. It's the government intrusion into our lives. Obamacare okay. is a perfect example. Where you have a structural change where you are going to be fined if you don't buy a product the government tells you you have to buy according to their regulation. That is a structural issue that once, that, if that ever gets left to stand, and honestly, one of my biggest things is repealing Obamacare. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what motivates me more than anything else. Okay. We're losing those kinds of freedoms. When you, when you take the free market aspect out of people's lives, you're going you're gonna to change the fundamental reason for, there to be, for them to live. They're no longer going to have careers to go after because you, how can you have a career when you can't work more than 29 and a half hours? Because mm -hmm. not everyone can afford Obamacare. Companies are cutting back having multiple groups of part-time workers because a full-time worker means you have to have Obamacare and it breaks the bank. One of the questions I also asked um, Congressman Cartwright was, I wanted to, to understand the success he has had or not had getting legislation pushed through. And he did speak about the fact that he has gotten legislation through the House in some instances, but that he hasn't gotten anything really that's been signed into law did per se. Did you know se. that he was voted the least effective legislator in America? He actually was saying he's one of the more effective. He, he, he referred mm -hmm. to some poll that he, well, about his effectiveness. Polls are not facts. Mm -hmm. Facts are facts. Mm -hmm. He said one thing passed, one out of, oh gosh, uh, close to a hundred bills he's presented, one. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So you would argue then obviously that he hasn't. Yes, I did not give him the name least effective legislator <laughs> in America. That was done by an independent group. Okay, and, they, and we can cite that, that later because it is, I, I did see it as a cited fact. Right. So, besides the fact that he supports Obamacare and... He says it didn't go far enough. What could be farther than Obamacare? Bernie Sanders. Right, I was going to say, yeah. yeah, yeah you feel pair, the burn. Yeah. You know what, kids today, they don't want to feel the burn. They want to feel the urn, but they've never felt the urn because they've grown up without the freedom to pursue their dreams. They've been stuck with this college debt, which is ridiculous. One, you know one of the aspects of Obamacare took over the student loan program? Why do you think these kids are paying 7%? If private banks, which it used to be before Obamacare, private banks, you can get 2% loan, that's a whole lot more manageable than a 7% loan. Hmm. Thanks, Obama. Mm -hmm. So besides the fact that he thinks Obamacare didn't right. go far enough and that climate change is tied as his number one priority and the fact that you've outlined that you know he doesn't necessarily have a record of success getting legislation turned into law what else is it that has you supremely concerned about congressman cartwright holding this seat for another two-year term well it's you know, you're one out of 435 okay in itself not that big of a deal but when you look at the things that have passed or not passed by one vote and we know what side he's going to be on. I mean, a guy who has Nancy Pelosi at his fundraisers, that is not a guy who looks at the Constitution as the brilliant document that it is. That is a guy who believes in social engineering, who thinks the government should run our lives. It, it's elitism taken to the nth degree. And we don't, that, that, that is never going to help America get forward. Because in America, you should be able to reach your potential, regardless of what it is, regardless of what your dream is. The government should not make or break you it should be out of the way. The government should be operating quietly in the background and you should be pursuing your dreams in the foreground. If you had your dream scenario, uh, you get elected, you become our next congressman for the 17th district and you get to be on a committee. Right. I mean, I know you would be a freshman, but you, know, you get to right, be on a committee. Right. What, what would you be interested in being on? Ways and means, because okay. that determines where the money goes and what is spent, okay. which is way too much. We need a huge re restraint on spending. Energy, because we're having a little reprieve now. If you remember when you and I spoke two years ago, gas was $3, $4 a gallon. Mm -hmm. um, now it's back to a somewhat sane levels, but that's not gonna change. Um, I mean, that's not gonna stay that way forever. 
so that's something that we have to, people are getting a little bit of a reprieve right now on their bills. Luckily, we had a mild winter and fuel prices and gasoline prices are low, so it's, it's working. But if you notice, people aren't spending that. They're not, they're not running out there and, and they're, they're saving it because they know that, quote, winter isn't over yet. Mm -hmm. um, so energy is one, ways and means is another, and transportation. Because I really have an issue with the way the government hang, uh, hangs uh, federal highway money over the states. Okay, talk to me about that. Okay, well, take ed education, for example. Education funding from the government is about 1%, but 90% of the rules come from the federal government. But, they get, but the school districts, they need the money. Same with, with any other thing. Remember when, um, oh, I remember this is back years and years ago, the drinking age, as an example. Uh, it was 18 in some states, 21 in the others. Well, the federal government said, if you leave at 18, we're not going to give you the highway money. And they use that all the time. I mean, I'm glad it's 21 everywhere, but the states should have decided that themselves. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have been from federal mandate. That's the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment basically says any power not given to the federal government by the Constitution belongs with the states. There are two important words not in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights, marriage and education. Okay, well, that you know, says you're, a lot. You're, you're doing a lot to emphasize the, so the Tenth Amendment, talk to me about that. Talk to me about why you think that's so important right now. Although I think I know what you're going to talk about, <laughs> well, a bit of federal overreach. But, well, but federal yeah, overreach, yeah. federal treason, it's very simple. When the founders wrote out the government's plan, they said checks and balances, you know, executive, judicial, uh, legislative branch. Okay, checks and balance, you know, it's triangle. Nothing can have more mm -hmm. power of the other. Federal government, keep us safe, protect our rights. Great. States can do everything else. You know, the state of Florida has very different needs than Maine, than Oklahoma, than Washington State, than Kansas. So why should the federal government be able to dictate things to them? It shouldn't be able to. Those states, as they were called, independent laboratories of democracy, they get to compete against each other. When you have, why do you think there's a mass exodus out of California and New York? Very high taxation. Mm -hmm. So that's one state gets, the, a lot of people from California are going to Texas. It's, it's, it's less expensive, it's a no-income tax state, all of a sudden these companies are thriving that we're getting stifled in California. If the federal government reigns over everything, then we're stuck. So we need to bring back that restraint of the federal, let the states do their thing. Competition only makes everyone and everything better. And the competition between the states for residents and businesses is exactly that in action. One of the things also uh, your opponent talked about when he was here was um, he spends a lot of time with his team um, working on bringing in grant money. And he really likes to talk about getting grants and grant, grant he, money. He's a Republican, right? <laughs> I'm just checking, because that sounds like Democrat talk. Because mm -hmm. where's that money come from? Your next door neighbor, right. the guy in Oklahoma? It's our the tax guy dollars. in Missouri. It's tax dollars. So you, you're saying you want to get grant money from other people's pockets, go through that magical filter of the federal government, and then land here? Well, you know what? The same thing is going from here out to everybody else. We need to let the states decide what they want to do with their money. Because a lot of states are excited when they say, oh, we're getting more grant money. It's coming from somewhere. It's coming from everybody. And right. the federal government is the least effective way to, distri to distribute anything, much less centrally control who needs what? Let the states do it. The best government is local government. Wouldn't it be great if you could find the person in the grocery store who's your state rep or your state senator, talk to them about something without them saying, well, that's a federal mandate. We can't do anything about it. We have to reverse that trend. You talk about, in addition to transportation, you talked about uh, wanting to be on a committee for energy. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about your, your uh, platform as related to energy and what you believe we need to be doing. I mean, I'm assuming, you being a conservative, that you're a big believer in energy independence. Absolutely. But, but tell me about that. If you look at what separates industrialized nations from third world, it's energy. It's that simple. When you have an abundance of natural resources and energy, you can build anything. As you, I'm the Industrial Revolution. We, we built everything. Everything that was great was made here until the regulators got involved until the EPA came and said, no, you can't, you can't build a factory. It's going to take a five-year uh, plan to look at the environmental impact. You go to China, they say, we're starting the bulldozers right now. Where do you want it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you get some overreaching OSHA regulations. You get all sorts of things. And it's well, impossible. It's, just, it's destroying the coal industry, for one, well, in Pennsylvania, yes, for yes. sure. Well, Mark, and Mr. Cartwright has said he's all for destroying the coal, coal industry. He's, he's made that very clear. Mm -hmm. That and, and you look at the fact that we have about two and a half trillion American private dollars in banks all around the world. Now, why aren't they in America? 
because the federal government wants to grab 35% of that when it comes in. Now, give them credit, if you're in a state, in a, in a nation that has, let's say, a 15% tax rate, they'll only take 20% because they'll, they'll credit you for that 15%. So who wants to take $2.5 trillion and give 20% to the federal government so then you can try to work within the structure of America with all the regulations, taxes, and, and EPA, and all the other things? No one wants to do that. That's why they're, that's why they're doing the inversion. That's why they're merging with companies outside of America, making that their base of operations, and taking advantage of those tax benefits. Mm -hmm. They're killing us, but the, the government has to do a major tax amnesty to allow that money to come back in, and they've got to back off on the tax rate and the regulations, because we can make it up with volume, but if they keep trying to get blood from that stone, the stone's going to be gone, and all the companies are going to be gone, and we're going to left, be left sitting here looking at saying, where did it all go? We drove it away piece by piece. Do people in your district talk a lot about natural gas just staying on energy? And, and does that come a lot up a lot or not it, so it much? It sort it's of more does. One thing that uh, the big misinformation is the severance tax. Mm -hmm. They think, well, how can those companies get away without paying tax? Well, let me give you a little input. Right now we have what's called an impact fee, which means the gas companies, when they drill, pay the communities that are impacted by the, the trucks going and the drilling and that kind of stuff. If we had a severance tax, first of all, that tax is a pass-through tax. Whatever that tax rate is, it's going to go right to every homeowner because the gas company is not going to say, well, we're just going to take it out of our stash, right? They're going to say, this is an extra cost. We have to raise our prices accordingly. So everyone is going to pay that severance tax. And the severance tax goes to Harrisburg. It doesn't go to the local community. So that's going to go into a pot, and who knows where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the questions that they do ask, and I explain to them. OK. Um, I just want to jump back to the transportation since that was another committee you mentioned you wouldn't mind working on. Um, I could swear that Congressman Cartwright at one point, not this last time he was on my show, but a couple years ago talked a lot about rail and interest in rail. Okay. I, I know he has done that. Um, rail is a project that it, it's, not, it's not a winner from the marketplace. It's a loser. As a matter of fact, every person on Amtrak, I think, is subsidized 200 to $250 by the government. Mm -hmm. So if you take a train from D.C. to New York and it costs you $400, it actually costs $650 and the government pays $250. Rail is one of those feel-good green projects that it's a loser. It's a money loser. People don't take it because it's not convenient. It's not that much faster than driving. It's not overly it's not overly beneficial in any way, but it is a big infrastructure problem and a project, and they love infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. So let's say, again, you're, you're elected to Congress. What would be the first two or three things that you would really focus on doing? Repealing Obamacare. Yes. <laughs> we know that. Yes. Um, there, there are so many things. You know, the veterans, we need to respect our veterans. The VA is such a disaster. Why shouldn't any veteran be able to go right into any hospital and just not worry about Use the bill? Use whatever hospital they whatever want. Whatever the hospital they want, have a relationship with a doctor, no waiting. Did they wait to go into battle to us? No, they didn't. When they, when they kept us free, there was no waiting. They charged ahead. Why should they wait for, wait for health care that way? Mm -hmm. um, tax regulation issue, that's, I've, I've beaten that one pretty mm -hmm. handily here. Yes. Um, it, that's, a, that's a biggie. I don't know what specific bills would be involved in that. but. Any time there would be a bill that had to do with increasing regulations or taxes, I would vote against it. When you're out about on the campaign trail and you're, you're driving all around the 17th district, which is an interesting district, how it goes from Schuylkill and it sort of okay. jukes around the Hazleton area and it, it, it gets up into the Wilkes-Barre area. Um, what are you hearing from the people they care about most? Oh, it's the economy, mm -hmm. without a question. They're, they, they don't see any improvement over the last seven years. Jobs, economy, Nothing. families, I mean, the, 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 kid, the kids, I've had college kids ask me, is this supposed to be better than this? I mean, and they're, they're not being funny. They're being serious. It's like, you know, I'm making $11 an hour now. I live at home. And I just said, look, I grew up under Ronald Reagan, okay? Reaganomics was you start a business in your garage and you go off and you, and you create a business and you live your life and you make money and you're happy. Obamanomics is you come back into your parents' garage and you live there to get free health care and, and get $11 an hour to work. It's, it's, it's really an inter interesting dichotomy between what freedom and less government will do for people, especially young college graduates, versus this, you know, they say, what, 5% unemployment? It's closer to 15. Mm -hmm. When you've got 95 million people who could work and are not working, the last time we had that many people, that few people working was like 1977. Mm 
-hmm. yet they say it's 5% five, 5 or 4.9% because they quit looking. So what are they doing? You have, a, you have a dramatic increase of people on welfare and food stamps. We've got to get those people off because it's, it kills human dignity, let's be honest. We need a safety net, but when it becomes a way of life or when there's no hope, that's not good. That's a big issue in, in your district. It is a big issue, yeah. I mean, th these people don't see a way out. There's, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And when you take away hope, you've got a real problem. And we've got to make sure that gets reversed soon before despair sets in. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things you talked about earlier in the show, you talked about the fact that you have the support of Dr. David Moylan. Yes. And um, Lorraine Cummings, who was yes, the nominee. Yes, well, that was going to be my next question. Tell us about some of the other support that you have and some of the endorsements that you have. Well, I, I have asked for no endorsements because I don't really see what the point of asking someone to endorse you is. But okay. I've had a number of people have just come to me and volunteered it. Uh, and the two biggie, well, there's a number of them, but the two biggies are Dr. Moylan, who, mm -hmm. like I said, three weeks after he lost in the general to, to Matt Carteright, he said, Matt, this Matt, um, are you going to run in 16? I said, absolutely. He said, we're 100% behind you, as is all of his people. Teresa Santi Gaffney, who was his campaign aide, uh, who was just reelected for as a um, recorder of wills mm -hmm. in Schuylkill County, mm -hmm. she's behind me 100%. Uh, Lorraine Cummings, uh, a lot of the chair. And that's a big name, Lorraine Cummings. Well, she is the only, I shouldn't say the only, she's the first and only female commissioner in Lackawanna County. Mm -hmm. And she's behind me 100%. And she's a uh, spitfire. She ran for this seat. She did in uh, 2012. She yes, was, yeah. and she knows her stuff. She's she a does. real conservative. No, I've she's, had her on the show. I'm yeah, yeah. a big oh, yeah. Maureen Cummings okay. fan. I, and I, I anyone just, who knows her really is a big fan as well. Well, because she knows the issues. Yes, she does. So that's certainly and a she's, testament she's to you. she's fearless also. Yes, yes. Well, and she's proving her fearlessness in county commission up there. Oh, well, that's good to hear. That's yeah. good to hear. So really, there's probably about two minutes left or so. Um, if people want to learn more about you, they can go to your website. Right. Okay, and we're pulling that up on screen throughout okay. the show. So they could go to your website. I'm assuming you're on Facebook as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. This okay. is Matt County for Congress on Facebook. Easy to find. Okay. Really, just to close out the last couple of minutes, I'm going to let you appeal directly to the people and okay. tell them why they should elect you. If What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. Expecting different results, I should say. If you keep electing the same kind of people we've had in the past, we're gonna get more of the same. You need to elect someone who on day one says, everything I do, everything I vote for is gonna be through the prism of, is this the original role of government? Should we be doing this or is this just getting lost in the, in the forest and wondering how to get out? The problem we have in this nation now is not one that can be managed to get out of it. We've got to turn the ship around. That's really important, and that's going to take courage. That's something I've demonstrated I've had over the years, and that's something that I'm living for as far as this job, as far as being your congressman. It's something I'm, I'm looking forward to do. I need your support, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. I just so enjoy having you on the show. You really are. You're, you're a fascinating gentleman, um, an accomplished man. You, uh, you know, being a conservative myself, which is no secret to my viewing audience, I... Which is why I, your viewing audience is so big. Well, I respect and admire your, your, your understanding and knowledge as related to the issues. And um, certainly it's going to probably be a tough fight over the next uh, couple of weeks as you're fighting your way it to is, the primary. It is. Look, I worked hard to get my opponent elected to a four-year term about two and a half years ago. I was a little surprised when he said he was going to run for Congress. But you know what? Competition only makes us better. I've been saying that all, all, all of our interview, and that's I welcome competition because the, the cream will rise to the top. Okay. Well, and with that said, I wish you the best of luck in the primary and in the general. We'll you know see. I'm coming. Well, well, if you, certainly if you pull that off, we will be happy to have you back. I I'm will always be here. happy to have you. And remember, folks, when you look around and you don't like what you see, don't complain about it. You can do something about it. You can always vote. And I thank you for watching.